state funeral for Chief Sir Silas Atopare. Papua LNG to see boost in economy. And WASH partnership sees development. Hello and welcome. This is Tuesday's News. I'm Kilawani. Former Governor General Chief Sir Silas Atopare was accorded a state funeral this morning. The Prime Minister, Governor General Grand Chief Sir Bob Dadai, and dignitaries, including the Diplomatic Corp, were in attendance. Family, friends, and church members were also part of the small crowd that gathered at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium to bid the chief farewell. The state funeral of the late Chief Sir Silas Atopare was held today. It was held in the presence of the Prime Minister, Grand Chief Sir Bob Dada, Governor General of PNG and the PNG Defence Force Commander Major General Gilbert Torpo and other dignified guests including the Diplomatic Corps. The funeral procession was led by the Wanigela SDA Church with their King's Witnessing Choir Group embracing this momentous occasion. The Prime Minister gave his address, followed by the Governor-General. Late Chief Sir Silas Atapara's casket then departed the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium for Port Mosby Funeral Home, led by the ceremonial guard. The late chief entered politics in the 1980s and served as the 7th Governor-General of Papua New Guinea from November 1997 to November 2003. In 1998, he was knighted as a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George by the Queen. A highlight of his career is bringing order when violence and controversy marred the electoral process in PNG's oil and gas-rich Southern Highlands Province in 2002 National General elections. The late Chief Sir Silas Atopare died at the age of 70 at his home in Goroka, Eastern Highlands Province, during the 46th Independence Celebrations. His casket will be flown home tomorrow to Goroka for burial. Kilawani National MTV News. Petroleum Minister Karanga Kua says there will be money coming into the country as early as mid next year when the pre-feed work of the country's second liquefied natural gas train begins. The government estimates the third LNG train, Pinyang, to come into construction towards the back end of the decade. Very good question. That, that's the kind of question that... The Petroleum Minister is confident the sector will help steer the economy on course in the not-too-distant future. In Papua, we might see some small early cash flows coming in by the middle of next year, by the middle of uh, next year, 2022. Uh, at this stage, they are at the pre-feed stage. In other words, they are organizing for feed. You know, you go to employ all the people and set up all the administrative structures and give them, you know, their duty statements and all these things have to be organized so that when these people are all assembled during the pre-feed stage, then these people will then take on the responsibility of launching the feed itself. Mr. Kua says the multi-billion dollar Papua LNG project led by French company Total will take four years to construct. After that, the long-awaited third LNG train should begin. Now that construction, Papua LNG, will take place for over four years. So if they started in 2024, they will finish by around 2028 and immediately demobilize from Papua and go and crank up work in Pinyang. The Pinyang project will again be developed by global LNG giant ExxonMobil. Some good days in front of us starting around 2027, because you'll be picking up from the uh, construction spend expenditures for the Papua and Pinyang, Papua at the tail end and Pinyang at the beginning, 2027, and um, dividends coming from, beginning to come through from PNG LNG. So there'll be like dual streams of cash flow coming in. However, legacy issues with the first still exists. PNG LNG, uh, we are still in the process of paying back our, our loans, 
our borrowings for the financing of our involvement, our equity in that project. So we expect that that will be paid up around about uh, 2027. Uh, could have been earlier, but for COVID and all that. Uh, the construction of the two new LNG projects hopes to bring in revenue that will boost the economy, similar to that of the U.S. 19 billion Kina PNG LNG project, which in its construction phase propelled growth in all sectors. As a result, the economy grew, evident in the 2012 national budget of 10.5 billion Kina, the first past the 10 billion Kina mark. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV News. Meanwhile, the government is confident of signing the Pinyang Gas Agreement with ExxonMobil by the end of this year. This follows the signing of two heads of agreement between the state and the developer. As per the recent meeting, parties have agreed for a state take of 63% in the project, the biggest of any extractive deal in the country's history. These heads of agreement are not a substitute for a gas agreement. They're not a substitute. The gas agreement, uh, this is a commitment to conclude the gas agreement with the, uh, the major targets being identified. Now that we've achieved that, we have to move forward to negotiate the actual gas agreement and that will take place uh, after the next two weeks. We've allowed for two weeks for parties to uh, work, uh, work out their final positions, and then negotiations will resume after two weeks to run that final mile to the conclusion of the actual draft of the gas agreement. More legal work still needs to be done before the reopening of the Pogera mine in Anga province. Prime Minister James Marpe, after meeting with CEO of Barrick New Guinea Limited, Mark Bristow in the U.S., said there are some technical and legal outstanding matters that need to be sorted out before the mine reopens. MTV News understands the commencement agreement is amongst the outstanding matters. I cannot allow the mine to be open on a platform that is not, uh, not solid and sound for all of us, including our investors. There are one or two critical issues that need, need us to resolve, including uh, our investors' view that SML is unsound, and those tests will still be running, and we, will, uh, we commit to have extensive uh, uh, consultations in, in the month of uh, October. And hopefully as we go through, Mr. Bristol and his team will come in again around mid-October for us to have fun, uh, put final uh, processing and final uh, uh, wedding together so that hopefully towards the mid-October and the end of October we should have a, a view of when Pogra should be open again. So those were the issues that we achieved. We just didn't went to the United Nations for our conversation. We targeted conservation of our forests for uh, people to pay for our conservation of forests. And of course, we went down to meet our investors in as far as uh, resource projects were concerned. That's all from me. Any this is National MTV News. More stories when we come back. Welcome back to the news. The National Research Institute launched its key 2019 indicators for universal basic education today. The report is designed to inform the country on the status of the basic education at the district level in order to inform and challenge authorities on the appropriate actions to improve the universal basic education system. The key indicator set provides a good picture of the progress made in 2019 towards achieving the three indicators for the universal basic education sector, which are access, retention and quality. Quality basic education lays the foundation for personal development of the individual. And it lays indeed the foundation uh, for future learning. So once you have literate and numerate, you can continue your education and information because the world is full of information through different technologies. And so if you're literate, you can continue that journey, learning more about the world around you. 
According to the data presented, there were about 7,850 elementary and 3,704 primary schools in 2015. However, enrollment in basic education increased significantly from 1.8 million children enrolled in 2015 to about 2.1 million in 2019 at basic education level. We are now releasing this today at the 2019 uh, UB Indicators Report using the same format so that it is easy for making comparisons over time. So one area in development is how can we compare what has happened in the past so that we can learn lessons now to make improvements for the future. So I think a standard format helps in this regard. While there has been a gradual improvement of the quality of education from 2015, the 2019 report showed that it is still below the national standard. Fellow researcher Dr. Webster says the results fluctuate because of various reasons. But we would like to, in the between the years, go down to the provinces and work with the provinces and help them say, look, your district in this district it didn't, uh, it didn't perform poorly, well, then access, retention, and quality. What could be contributing to that? And, and even go down to the districts and say, in this district, there were, you know, so what could be the factors? And help them to identify the constraints. Because as I said, it could be one constraint in one uh, school or community, but it could be a different constraint in another community. So However, Dr. Webster says a lot still needs to be done to minimize the outcome of the level of basic education in districts and provinces around the country. Podivai, National MTV News. A non-government organization in partnership with JICA and UNICEF is rolling out a water sanitation and hygiene or wash program in Rigo District. The program covers over 30 schools and 80 villages. A wash facility for the Sivitatana village in the Rigo Central LLG was officially opened recently. Sivitatana village is one of the pilot villages in Rigo district selected to roll out the WAS project. The WAS project recently opened will benefit a population of over 1,000 people and 137 households. A toilet facility was opened along with the WAS project which saw the village being declared as open defecation free. The program is being rolled out by Anis Foundation Inc., a local NGO funded by JICA and UNICEF. You are a good community. You look after us. You respect us. We are Team ODF. Your school program goes very well without disturbance. This is very good. Keep it up. Become a nice, healthy, good community, model community in Rigo. Under this program, better water supply and toilet facilities are being built in selected schools and villages. The water and sanitation program is being rolled out in over 80 villages and 30 primary and elementary schools in Rigo district. So far, most villages in Rigo inland area have been completed, with few coastal villages yet to be covered. The people have been urged to work together with the NGO to ensure better water supply facilities are established. The school program that we are running, now our school are beginning to transform. They now have wash facility. They have better toilets. Their toilets are international standard. They have flush toilet and they have safe VIP toilet. For most villages in Rigo, access to clean water has always been a challenge. The establishment of these facilities will ease the burden of traveling long distances to fetch water and it helps promote healthy lifestyle. To minimize sickness and also to cut down on this uh, orphan defecation, we are proud to have Anis Foundation who have taken this in initiative to run this pro pilot program in Rigo District. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. All palm rehabilitation work for smallholder farmers in Millen Bay province has just been completed with over 26 contractors paid last week. The idea is to help smallholders rehabilitate their blocks to increase production. More fruits means more income for the blockholder, revenue for the company and the country. Marco Roy and Jimmy Tony are at the Oil Palm Industry Corporation office in Millen Bay Province to collect their payments for cleaning oil palm blocks. They are among 26 other contractors engaged by OPIC to help rehabilitate oil palm blocks in the province. Some oil we get in two envelopes, 
and some will be one. Those two, yeah. All man and all hamamas, because most of the time all man have a steam all palm law, bus. Where all man no not have manage my own blocks, but all Mi plato thank you, lo government give kiss him this la, something come. So what all make him this la, lo all grow us, lo I leave him all mangi lo sim, make him this la can lick, lick income lo all lo pocket lo all. Mi like to thank you, lo government blim. Oil palm was first planted in Milim Bay in 1985. The oil palm plantations were set up in the form of nucleus estate schemes in which the palm oil plantations and the crude oil mill were jointly owned by the plantation companies. The areas around the plantations were allocated to small holders who grew their own oil palm to supply the fresh fruit bunch or FFB to the mills for processing and exporting of crude palm oil. Milim Bay has a total of 843 smallholder farmers covering 1,700 hectares of land. Over the years, many blocks were left to deteriorate due to various reasons. The current OPIC management has stepped in to help. So now that we have gone into rehabilitation, the next phase of it is that we will be looking into uh, replanting the old age blocks. In fact, most of the areas here in, in, in Sagarai are all overdue for replant. And we've spent almost around about uh, uh, 400,000 of that money in the uh, Million Bay project area. Uh, with the four, three, four different locations, we have done block uh, rehabilitation. Earlier during the uh, week, we have uh, uh, signed contracts and also uh, paid uh, the contractors that have rehabilitated the blocks. Many are happy with the rehabilitation work. It's a very big help. Like previously, our blocks are all bushy and uh, we cannot afford to produce more crop coming out. Uh, but as for now, our blocks are clean and now we can produce more crop coming out to the roadside. Very big help to us as people living in the rural places. Many of us, we, we, we don't have big oil palms or we don't own oil palm blocks. But when this kind of opportunities are given to us, it's, it's to us, it's, it's like very, very big help. The PNG Oil Palm Industry Corporation was established by the PNG OPIC Act 1992 to replace a DPI and DAL smallholder oil palm extension service. Its core functions are to promote and encourage increased production of palm oil through provision of efficient extension services to smallholders, including pest and disease management, collect, record and compile vital data with regards to the industry and consult, liaise and collaborate with the state and other agencies and authorities concerned or involved in the industry, including growers and the private sector. Shamit Poriam of National MTV News. The Coconuts Industry Corporation in Medang is trialling out the proper lining on the coconut farming systems. This is to ensure best production output for farmers. The coconut farming system is not new. It was practised in the past but without proper lining systems. Coconut farming system is a program that focuses on expanding income revenues on different crops that can be planted together with coconuts. At the Steward Research Station, food crops like pineapple, sweet potato, rice, peanuts, and few other crops, including cash crops like vanilla, are being integrated with coconuts. That is the approach that we should encourage our coconut um, growing communities to take on board because it is the a type of system that is a two-way system. It gives back to the soil, it neutralizes or it gives back the good nutrition to the soil, especially in the crops such as peanuts and beans that can be planted into the, um, the available space. So that it gives the, the nutrients to the coconut and also um, it gives, it increases the income where you can get from both crops at the same time. KIK believes it is important to have a farming system as coconut uses only 20% of the land 
while the other 80% of the land remains unused. The system helps farmers to plant other crops and increase the generated farm revenue. CFS is the program that um, concentrates or focuses on diversifying income earning revenues on various uh, crops that are being integrated with coconuts. A number of trainings on CFS were conducted at the station for farmers. Research officer Sarah Joe explains how the system also tackles the issue of land scarcity and food security. Um, land is also becoming an issue, land shortage issue. So farming systems would be the only um, program that would um, address the land issue problem because then you could have so many things or different crops growing in the same piece of land already. The farming system is only in Medang and KIK is preparing to introduce the concept to other coconut growing provinces. Martha Louise National, MTV News, Medang. And now looking at the Nesfund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, Yokina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3769 Australian dollars, 0.2308 Euro and 30.17 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee closed lower, cocoa and copper closed higher, crude oil is trading higher, palm oil and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed Lower, the ASX 200 is trading lower, and the All Ordinaries is trading lower. You're watching MTV News. More stories after the break. Welcome back to the news. The Lay City Authority is utilizing different funding support programs to rehabilitate roads in the city. The funding will come from the GST component of the Morabe Provincial Government, the DSIP component and the National Budget Support Program. Lay MP John Rosso said these support programs are helping the city authority to rehabilitate national and suburban roads. Uh. The Lay City Authority has engaged in various funding support programs to rehabilitate roads in Lay. These programs include the DSIP component as well as the National Budget Support Program. Another funding partnership is 20% of Morabe Provincial Government's GST collection. This was handed over to LCA at its proposal to help fund road rehabilitations. The GST component is being used to fix suburban roads. Through the GST component, you have the things like uh, the golf club uh, road that was done. You have uh, the East Taraka suburban roads that are currently being done. Those roads, I think, first stage has been completed. They are now uh, working on the second stage. Uh, Eriku, the streets at Eriku will shortly be uh, contracts been awarded. Uh, shortly the uh, work will uh, begin there. Uh, that's for all our suburban streets inside the Eriku. According to Lay MP John Rosso, road rehabilitation in Lay would cost approximately 200 million kina. The city's budget has not been enough to maintain funds for road rehabilitation alone, leading to the neglect on city roads over the years. With funding support, the Lay City Authority has managed to upgrade the Unitech to Egam Road and is currently facilitating the rehabilitation to the Malahang to Chinatown Road. These roads have been upgraded under the National Funding Support Program. So it's improving drainages, uh, improving the uh, road surface. It's going to be a concrete pavement surface all the way down to uh, Chinatown and the drainage will be wider and uh, a better drainage uh, system. That's to complement all the funding, uh, what you call it, all the flooding that happens in, uh, in Lay. Mr. Russell said industrial roads are also on LCA's road rehabilitation list and they are currently seeking partners to counterfund this project. Charlene Airy, National MTV News, Lay. 
It's been a challenging three years for the staff and students of the Huonville Primary School in Lei. In 2018, more than three of the school's classroom buildings were condemned and teachers were forced to teach in makeshift classrooms. Head teacher Mr. Diary Baru said, despite this, the school continued to function with the support of the board, teachers, parents and other stakeholders. On Friday, the school witnessed the opening of their new classroom buildings, built with support from the lay MP's office. This is the new Huonville Primary School's new 81 classroom building in Lay. Desks and chairs have been fitted, ready to cater for the grade 8 students who will start using the classrooms tomorrow. This comes as a relief as the school has been struggling with infrastructure over the past three years. The space in the building, in the classroom, in the rooms are, are big. We can cater more than 50 students. The Huonville Primary School is one of the oldest schools in Lei. In 2018, several of the school's classroom buildings were condemned by the fire service and the building board. The school was forced to close down and 1,400 students missed out on classes during that period. The board sought help from parents, teachers and business houses, including the district and provincial government. Within five weeks, makeshift classrooms were built and students returned to class while the school board continued to raise funds and sought help to build new classrooms. For the past three years, the school has been using these classrooms. Uh, it was a sad scenario where we, uh, all 24 classrooms were demolished where children were sent home. On Friday, the school witnessed the opening of the new classroom built with the support from the Lay MP's office, costing over one million kina. Lay MP John Rosso said this is part of the support given to help schools around the city. The city authority board has uh, assisted with the 18-1 uh, building. That is the start of the re rehabilitation program of uh, Huonville. Through district funding, to our member, Honorable John Rosso, uh, which now we can see that building up now. Mr. Baru commended his staff for their tireless efforts over the past three years and stated that the school plans to build more classrooms. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. A total of 1 million kina has been presented to seven different institutions in the country as school fee assistance for students from Simbu province. The Simbu provincial government made this payment today. Beneficiaries included Kumul Training Institute, Mapex Training Institute, Morabet Tibet, Global Training and JWK Air Aviation Training. Over 1,000 students will benefit from the school fee assistance program this year. Last year, a total of 2.5 million kina was paid to the schools to support students. Program coordinator James Gumailo says supporting human resource will help change society and the province. He further thanked Simbu Governor Michael Dua for the continued support to students from the province. The Eastern Highlands Adventist Students Association raised 34,500 kina in the last two days to to control the surge of COVID-19 in the province. President of the association, Jamal Hoggi, says this monies will go towards buying oxygen cylinders for the Gorka Hospital. He said they will work closely with the Eastern Highlands Provincial Health Authority to have the cylinders on the ground by the end of the week. So Eastern Highlands Adventist Students, uh, Adventist Students Association is a non-profitable organization, it is a student ministry. Uh, it was first established in 1987. This is its 34th year. Uh, COVID-19 has hit, uh, hit the Eastern Islands province hard like never before, especially in the last couple of uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago. A lot of people have died because of COVID-19. Uh, the issue is becoming so loud that um, the Eastern Islands Student the Eastern Islands Adventist Student Association cannot really ignore. Uh, so that's why it has taken this initiative to uh, do a fundraising through a uh, form of appeal to the general public, uh, Eastern Islands community, and also to uh, business houses who are operating inside Eastern Islands. The appeal started on Sunday, and it will end on October 10. It will end on October 10. Um, we have already, over the past two days, we have raised 34,500 kina. 
Uh, we are working towards acquiring um, oxygen bottles, uh, cylinders, and other necessary equipment that is going to be needed. Uh, we are also appealing uh, to the communities and the um, business houses out there to help us to work towards achieving and helping saving the lives of our people in the village, uh, in, in Groka who are struggling at the moment. We wanted to encourage each and every citizens out there to to um, adhere to the measures that the COVID-19 measures that is um, put it, put in place by the health and um, to to get vaccinated as much as possible if you can. Um, there's a lot of miscommunication around PNG um, on, on on vaccination that you know you'll you'll get vaccinated and you'll probably get a lot of side effects and stuff like that. But this vaccination thing is um is all about boosting your immune system mm. and getting yourself ready for um, that virus. Um, so it is encouraged. We encourage each and every one, every member of Eastern Islands, every member of citizens of PNG mm. to get vaccinated and get yourself ready and um, stay stay safe, yeah. The Asian Development Bank is looking at its new Pacific approach. It is a way to help smaller Pacific Island states build resilience to shocks such as coronavirus disease pandemic, deliver sustainable service, and support inclusive growth by scaling up ADB's private sector operations in the region. The new Pacific approach by the Asian Development Bank is in support of 12 developing Pacific Island states, the Pacific approach is our strategy at the Asian Development Bank for operations in 12 Pacific small island developing states over the next five years. These states are the Cook Islands, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia, Nauru, Niue, Palau, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. Resilience is at the very heart of this new Pacific approach. Building resilience is the key to sustainable development in the Pacific. The Pacific has been facing many challenges in the modern era. Climate change and COVID-19 are the current challenges being faced. And with these small island states lacking in the capacity and resources to tackle these issues, ADB is focused on building resilience for these states. We will continue to focus on vital areas of importance, improving transport, combating climate change, expanding renewables, and strengthening public sector management. But the approach also incorporates several new priorities. We have a much stronger emphasis on healthcare and protection for the vulnerable. COVID-19 has shown all of us how easily a health crisis can stretch health services and cripple entire economies. The challenges of COVID-19 has also caused a lot of setbacks to the private and public sector of smaller island states. ADB hopes to financially support these Pacific Island nations our trade finance program is going to increase access to finance for regional, medium, small, and micro enterprises. With the region still grappling with the health, social, and economic impact of the pandemic, the Pacific approach also has a stronger emphasis on healthcare services and social protection, as well as a new climate strategy for the region. Parts of this assistance have included grants to help the Pacific purchase medical and personal protective equipment, including gloves, masks, face shields. Uh, we've provided support to frontline health workers. And Pacific governments have also used our support to, to advance economic stimulus to support affected private sector workers and businesses. Fidelis Sukina National, MTV News. You're watching MTV News. Trukai Sports is next. Don't go away. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. Team Goroka has retained their title in the 46th Takuru Force Lone Balls Tournament held over the weekend at the Murray Barracks Defense Bowling Club. It was a successful tournament that saw 27 teams taking part in the annual event. It was an eventful weekend for the Lawn Bowls community with the annual Takuru Falls Lawn Bowls Tournament at the Defence Bowls Club in Port Mosby. 
teams from Ley, Bulolo, Medeng, Goroka, Hagen, Bissini in Port Mosby and the Defence Bowls Club all participated in the two-day tournament. After a long two days of play, it was the team from Goroka last year's winners who retained their title against a determined lay side, nine points to seven. Senior Vice President of the Defence Bowls Club, Orea Boino, was happy with the turnout. Goroka has retained their cup again. They're the best, type, best bowlers. They've come down and uh, represented themselves from their province. Uh, I know that they have a lot of uh, uh, the COVID uh, thing is happening up at Goroka, but uh, we have protocols that uh, we have used to make sure that they're all clear to come and play and that they are now the, the winners of the tournament. There was a COVID-19 lockdown in Goroka, Eastern Highlands province, but the team was determined to make it to the tournament and it proved to be a fruitful decision. We are the defending champions uh, from Goroka Bowling Club, so we have to put up a team no matter what. That's why no, normally we, we bring in, you know, like four, five teams, six even. But this time around, you know, the situation didn't allow, so people are trying to team in up low, affordable to come, and we managed to bring in two. The lone bowlers from Goroka managed to retain the title under some pressure, but they remained confident despite the challenge by other teams in the tournament. Uh, who you are, what you, what you do, you champion or not, it's about you know concentrating your game, delivering your balls right, and getting it right, and you, you make it through. So, I'm I'm very proud of my of my team. The Defence Bowls Club was thankful that the tournament had the approval. Despite a ban on sporting events across the country due to COVID-19, it was rewarding that the tournament went ahead. Because I've been in uh, the military camp, I say thank you to the commander and the deputy commander and uh, the commissioner of police to give us the green light and the sports foundation. To, because it was an uh, event that we normally run and we can't postpone it because we had sponsors on board. And I'd like to say thank you to uh, Como Petroleum. The major sponsors, we have uh, uh, PNG Pots, we had uh, oil sheds, they've came up with a uh, check of cash of uh, 4,300. Fidelis Sukina, Trukai Sports. With the recent election of the new board members of the Papua New Guinea Rugby Union, presidents from provincial unions have highlighted the need for PNG RU at the local competitions. Rugby union in PNG has seen a setback in the past few years. One of the reasons is because of poor administration. This is difficult for rugby union to develop at the provincial level. In our, our respective province, provinces, so that's why you see all of us here. We are backing um, our newly elected president. So we believe that through him, we, I mean, um, rugby can be reached out to the rural areas in Papua New Guinea. So that's our main uh, focus. One of the key concerns raised by presidents from each province is for PNG RU to make their presence known to small centers where the code of rugby union is played. This is vital to boost the sport in PNG. I, I, I thought that maybe this is the right part that I should uh, join these guys so that I, I can feel the presence of PNG rugby in Daru as a, as a small center compared to uh, bigger centers like Mosby and Lay. COVID-19 has affected most sports activities in the country, as well as the Oceania region. The new PNG RU board members, led by President Paul Siwi, have been urged to utilize rugby union programs. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of rugby programs. Um, despite COVID, there's a lot of activities and there are still a lot of opportunities and planning in, in the Pacific. So um, this is the time to take advantage of, of that. Suli Suli, Trukai Sports. And that ends Trukai Sports. The weather report is next. All the details after the break. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. Looking at the regional weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. Southern region, Port Mosby mostly fine, partly cloudy at times. 
Daru, mostly fine, partly cloudy. Kerma and Popondeta becoming cloudy with patchy rain at times. Alotau, fine, partly cloudy with possible showers by the morning. For the Mamase region, Lei and Medeng becoming cloudy with some overnight showers possible. We wake and Vanimo, cloudy periods with brief morning showers. For the New Guinea Islands region, Lorengau becoming cloudy with chances of morning showers. KVN easing rain showers, then partly cloudy morning. Kokopo and Rabao, cloudy periods with some rain showers. Kimbe, cloudy with chances of morning showers. Buka, occasional rain showers and thunderstorms. For the Highlands region, all centres, cloudy periods with patchy rain, then morning fog. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the new sports and weather for today, Tuesday, 5th of October 2021. Until next time, pleasant viewing, be safe, bye for now.